So your exam is tomorrow, and I believe I showed you this slide before. Just to be on the safe side, I would like to show you again a few tips uh, for the exam. First of all, this is an analytical subject. Please do not memorize the solutions. Try to understand the concept. During your exam, uh, please uh, read the description first before you attempt to solve the problem. Some of the students, uh, they believe they're solving that problem, but the solution is not correspond to whatever is in the examination paper. So please uh, read the example first before uh, start uh, solving it. And the most important thing is, if uh, your uh, solution is correct, but the final answer is not correct, you get the majority of that mark. But if you just give me the correct answer, there is no solution, you will get just a fraction of the total mark. And the other thing is, you only have two hours, and my uh, advice is, just solve the problem as many as you can, at the end, if you've got time, go back and have a look. So you don't waste your time on an example because you, at the end of the day, you want to get a good grade for this course and obviously for other courses. And as I said, if uh, you read a, a question and cannot solve it at the time, you can come back to it uh, later. Are there any questions in regard to, to the tips I've given you here? And please solve a few questions just using your examination data sheets. I believe the examination data sheets, the ones which are attached to your paper at the moment, are available. I uploaded them for you before um, Christmas break. So solve a few questions just using them without looking at your notes. Yes, please. Of course, you can. Of course, you can do whatever you want, and you can take it home afterwards. I believe. Yes, do whatever you want. Yes. Any questions? Any other questions? So, what I've got here, uh, I've got a PDF files. Whatever you have online, I've got it here as well. So, I'm going uh, to briefly go through chapters four, five, and six, which are slightly harder than chapters one, two, and three. And at any time, you can stop me, raise your hand, ask questions. This is not a lecture. This is a revision session. So in chapter four, uh, you learned about the theories of uh, torsion. So when a component is subject to torsion, the torsion, the effects of torsion, in terms of stress, is shear stress. So any cross-section, which is a normal to the axis of the beam, cylinder, tube, is subject to shear stress. In terms of a deformation is twist. So the one, the end, wherever you are applying the torque, twists with respect to the other end, which is clouds. Now in chapter four, we have three different sets of equations. We as I started with analysis of a circular cylinders. And then I moved on. The circular cylinders could be solid, could be thick or thin walled with uniform thickness. Then we analyzed a thin walled closed sections. So the thin walled closed sections could be single cell, could be multi cell. And finally, we analyzed open thin walled sections subject to torsion. So what they have in common is that you analyze mostly shear stress on the section and angle of twist. But we use a three different sets of equations. So the, the way we analyze circular sections of the torsion is not the same as the way we analyze thin walled sections which are closed, either single cell or multi cell, and also open sections. So I repeat, we have three different sets of equations in chapter four for analysis of component which are subject to torsion. I repeat again, so what they have in common, we analyze them and find a shear stress applied, angle of twist for thin sections obviously is more convenient to find shear flow rather than shear stress. So we started, so on, on the slide one, you understand the difference between 
a torsional moment and a bending moment. When we apply torsion, the moment is tangent or parallel to the section, and if you apply a moment, the plane of the moment is normal to the plane of the section. So as I said, we have three different sets of equations in this chapter because we have different assumptions. So these are the assumptions for analysis of circular section subject to tor torsion. And we can use double arrow in a two-dimensional diagram to show, to, to show torsion, or we can use just an arrow, a KV arrow, to show torsion. So on the slide number five, based on the, yes please. Yes. So you need to use your right hand rule. So the thumb, the double arrow, is in the direction of the thumb. And the way my fingers, right hand the finger curl, I mean the fingers curl, is, it shows the direction of the torque, torsional moment. Does that answer the question? So double arrow for two dimensional diagram and a curve, a curvy arrow for three-dimensional one. So although it is, the problem is three-dimensional, still we can relate the shear stress to shear strain using the same equation we had in chapter one. Because it's, the structure is subject to simple shear. So the shear stress is a shear modulus multiplied by shear strain. Now on the slide in number five, we, I use equilibrium method by equilibrium, by equating the external torque with the resisting torque on the body, we manage to find these two equations. So the first equation gives us the angle of twist, and the, I mean the relation between the angle of twist and the torque applied, and the second equation gives us the relation between the shear stress and the torque applied. So if whatever you see on the slide five is based on equilibrium. So the product of G and J is called torsional stiffness. You can see we have got an element of, we've got an element of material property, shear modulus, an element of Geometry is a polar second moment of area. So the T is the torque applied, the length of the cylinder, and the bottom one is the shear stress, the torque applied, the radius of any point from the center, and J obviously is the polar second moment of area. So you can see for solid cylinder, we use a pi fourth power of diameter of the cylinder divided by 32. For a hollow cylinder, we say 5 over 32, 4 power of outer diameter minus 4 power of inner diameter. Yes, please. Well, the, uh, the hollow thick walled um, cylinder, the radius, do you take it as the radius uh, the, of the mean radius or the outer radius? For if it is a solid cylinder, it, we don't have mean diameter or if mean radius. Hollow. If it's hollow, if it's a thick walled, uh, no we go for the real radius. If it's a thin walled section, yes, we can use the mean diameter or mean radius. It doesn't affect your solution. That was a good question. So if you've got a solid cylinder, we just use the radius at any point, the distance of any point from the center. If it's a thick walled cylinder, again, just radius of any point. But if it's a thin walled cylinder, you can use outer diameter and inner diameter, but the answer doesn't make it much different if you use a mean radius or mean diameter. Uh, as, yes, please. Sorry, when you say uh, just the radius, do you mean like the end or like the out? Okay, so when you're calculating, say you've got a thick wall cylinder and you're finding the shear stress distribution. So this is a profile of the shear stress distribution you can see here. So we've got the maximum shear stress on the outer layer and we've got a minimum stress on the inner layer. So R here is a radius at any point from the center. So what happens is that is in calculation of J, 
this is Dio, which is the outer diameter, which is Di, which is the inner diameter of the cylinder. So for this one, in calculation of J, we use outer diameter, inner diameter. And if I was asked to find the maximum shear stress, obviously it occurs on the outer layer. The minimum shear stress, as you can see on the profile, is on, on the inner layer. And if I was asked to calculate the stress at any point, I just use the radius. So mean ra radius, mean diameter, is not for a solid section or for a thin wo uh, thick walled section. We only use mean diameter and mean radius when the section is very thin. It doesn't affect the solution. Does it answer the question? OK. Any other question on slide number five? So what you see on slide number five, we found them using equilibrium. Now, if you look at the slide, um, oh, OK, that slide number six, I just units used in this chapter, you're familiar with. And the only thing which was new to you, and I introduced you to, was angle of twist and rate of twist. So theta, the unit is in radians. If you were asked in the exam to convert it to degrees, do it. If you're not asked to do it, just leave it as radians. You will receive the copy mark for that question. Some of the, I mean, if you look at the past papers, some of the question I ask the students to show me the derivation, yes, yes. But some of the, obviously, the derivation are very long. You won't be asked those questions. But some of them are relatively short, maybe one or two lines, yes, yes. You need to know how those equations are found. So I repeat, if you're not asked to find this in degrees, just leave it as it is, you get the full mark for the question. Now, the characteristic of or characteristics of shear stresses, they're always a complementary. It was an exam question a couple of years ago. So the shear stress is always a complementary. Whenever we have a shear stress on a plane, we always have shear stress on planes which were perpendicular to the first one. And because of rotational equilibrium. If we only have this shear stress, or the one above it, it means the component is rotating. So because of rotational equilibrium, whenever we have shear stresses on a plane, on one plane, we have it on planes a normal to the first one. So this is the definition of shear stress is complementary. And because the torque applied applies a shear stress on the cross section, and because of this characteristic, not only we have shear stresses on the cross section, we also have in the longitudinal direction. As you can see, not only we have on this plane, we have it on a plane which is normal to the first one, which they are called longitudinal because they are along the axis of the cylinder. Now, on the slide uh, number eight, I showed you how to find the strain energy stored in a, a bar subject to torque. So this is a, the torque angle of a twist response. The area under this curve gives us the work done by the external torque. And I also showed you that we can, from the torque, from the shear stress, a shear strain diagram, we can find the strain energy stored per unit volume of the uh, structure. So, based on the conservation of the concept of the conservation of energy, the work done by the external force is stored as a strain energy, so they must be the same. So, this is S a little e, which is the strain energy stored per unit volume. Now, is if the energy or the stress is uniformly distributed in the body. What you could do, you can just multiply S little e by the volume to find the work done or the energy stored. So for the examples we saw in chapter one, they were mostly subject to uniform stresses. So we were allowed to multiply S little e to, to the volume, I mean, to find the total energy stored. Now, as you can see, shear stress here has a linear variation. 
So therefore, I'm not allowed uh, to multiply this literally by the volume to find the total energy. So for component subject to torsion, it's quite straightforward. Once you have the angle of twist in radians, you multiply it by the torque, divide it by two to find the total energy stored or the work done. Or you can use these integrals. It's the same. You get the same answer. So the question you asked, I, one of the exam papers I asked and I showed it, I asked his students to find uh, this equation based on the law of conservation of energy. So on previous slide, we find this equation based on equilibrium. On this slide, we find the same equation based on the law of conservation of energy, equating uh, the energy stored with the work done. So we find the same equations. I think that is all these equations on your examination data sheets. What the students expected to do to assemble them. So no memory. So you have this, this equation in the exam paper. You have this equation in the exam paper on the data sheets. What they had to do, they had to show that this is a volume integral of the energy stored, and then you just equate it with the work done to find this relation. Now, if we analyze a circular cylinder, which is a thin wall, we can treat it like a thick wall cylinder, or we can like a solid cylinder. So we can use the same equations we had previously, theta equal to T over GJ, or the shear stress is equal to TR over J. The only approximation is in, for thin sections is for when it is, has a uniform thick, thickness is that, to find uh, the second moment of area differently, or polar second moment of area differently. So I repeat, if it's a thin walled circular cylinder, provided the thickness is uniform, we can just treat it as a solid cylinder or hollow cylinder, no difference. But thin sections for us, it's more convenient to use shear flow rather than shear stress. For a thin section, instead of using the force applied per unit area, it's better to use the force applied per unit length. And that's the definition of shear flow. So that was an exam question. I believe last year or the year before. What is the definition of shear flow? And what is its unit? So the force applied per unit length of the section, and obviously the unit is newton per meter or newton per millimeter. So from this slide onwards, we use, we analyze thin walled sections. And instead of shear stress, we started with shear flow. And if you were asked to find the shear stress, then what we did, we divided the shear flow by the thickness. So on the slide number 10, I gave you uh, the assumption used for analysis of thin walled tubes either single cell or multi-cell. So you can see the section can be arbitrary. The thickness is not uniform anymore. In the graph, the equation we had, if it's a thick wall, the thickness is uniform or is the same. So if it's a thin, the same. But from here onwards, so we can see the cross-section is arbitrary. The thickness is, yes, yes. Okay, that's a very good question. So if you if the component, say this is a thin board, and we're analyzing it in chapter one, is subject to an axial force, tension or compression. So when it comes to tension and compression, so you have uh, to deal with the cross-sectional area, which is this black area. So say this is subject to compression. So in that case, F divided by A gives you the stress at any point along the length. So you need the cross-sectional area. So I'm afraid I am using the same symbol for both, but in chapter one, we use A as the cross-sectional area. In this chapter, we use A as, for the previous section, we didn't need A. If you notice, we use J, because it does not affect the solution. So from here onwards, we use A is the area enclosed by the perimeter, and that is this area. So just repeat what you asked me. 
when we use A as a cross-sectional area, which is this black area, we use it when the force applied on the cross-section, either compression or tension. But from here onwards, we use A, area enclosed by the perimeter, and that's it. I mean, does it answer the question? Okay. So on slide number 10, you can see material is different around the section. The thickness is different. So that's why the equations are completely different. We cannot use the same equations we use for the other ones. So here, I showed you that if I've got a single cell tube, and if it's subject to a torque, single cell tube subject to a torque, the torque applies a constant shear flow around, around the section, regardless of its shape, regardless of the thickness whatsoever. So if I've got a, on a, a, a tube of arbitrary shape, the thickness can be anything, material can be anything. So you can see we end up with a constant shear flow around the section. And I showed you and I proved to you, for you that the shear flow, which is constant for a single cell, is equal to the torque applied divided by two times the area. What was A? Area enclosed by the perimeter. So this yellow area here. It's not the cross-sectional area. So Q is constant for a single cell, and T over 2A. A is enclosed by the um, boundary of the section. So again, this equation, you can see we used it for previous um, parts as well. The work done is equal to the torque multiplied by the angle of twist in radians divided by two. That is the work done. Then I showed you because of the relation T is equal to 2AQ, we can say the work done is equal to area enclosed by the perimeter, constant shear flow of a single cell multiplied by the angle of twist. Again, that was an exam question a few years ago. Based on the concept of conversation of um, energy, show this, that this equation, I mean, write, find this equation here. So everything you see on this slide, you can find them in your examination data sheets. You just need to assemble them. If you have a good knowledge, what you could do you have this equation, you just equate it with the total energy stored, and the total energy stored has been obtained by the volume integral of this term, which is the area under this curve, SE is equal to 2 squared divided by 2G. So this equation is valid for thin sections and thick sections, but because shear stress is variable, therefore we have we cannot multiply it by the volume. We have to find the volume integral. So slide 13 and 14 must have been together. It's a very, um, but because it was long, I divided them to two sections. So on this one, I showed you how to find the total strain energy. And then you equate it with this equation here to find the angle of twist. And in majority of textbooks for thin sections, we use rate of twist which is the angle of twist divided by the length. Either we use it, I'll show it as a differential equation, which is d theta over dz, because z is along the axis, or theta divided by l, where l is the length of the cylinder. So for a single cell, the shear flow is constant, but when it comes to multi-cell, when we apply a torque, because it's made of different materials, each cell is made of different materials, different construction, uh, different area enclosed by the perimeter. Therefore, we cannot use the same equation we had for a single cell tube. For a single cell, we have T equal to 2AQ. The torque is equal to 2 times the area enclosed by the perimeter. So this is what the equation we have, Q equal to, T equal to 2AQ. We use this equation to find uh, the rate of twist. You can see Q is located outside. T is located outside. I am eligible. I can use these two equations 
provided it's a single cell. Now we move on to double cell, multi cells. So on the slide 15, we combine compatibility equation with um, equilibrium equation. So this is equilibrium. These are compatibility. They all rotate with the same angle. So using these two, we managed to solve the problem. So if we've got two cells, we cannot solve the problem because we have one equation and two unknowns here. So we have to combine it with the compatibility equation to find the Q1, Q2, and the rate of twist. So any problem up to here, any questions? Yes, please. Okay, that's a good question. So we've got, it's very unlikely you get a three cell tube because otherwise you are going to spend all two hours to, oh, however, that's the, that's, uh, that's, uh, no, don't worry, yeah, yeah I know, I know yeah. which one, the, very, the solution to that one, you can find it in uh, the aircraft instructions by Maxim. If you go to the, towards the end, when it uh, anal is uh, showing you web idealization of uh, wing sections, the solution is there. However, I explain what it is here. So we've got, first of all, we start with the equilibrium, which is the torque applied is equal to 2A1Q1 plus 2A2Q2 plus 2A3Q3. You agree we've got A1, A2, and A3, which are the areas of these three cells. So we have one equation now. Now here we've got the compatibility equation. When I apply the torsion, all three of them rotate with the same angle. Now, I'm going to use it twice. First, I use these two, d theta over dz for cell number one is equal to d theta over dz for cell number two. So it gives me one equation. And then I equate these two, two and three, or one and three. You cannot use one and two, two and three, one and three as well. You can use it twice, plus one at the top. You end up with three equations, three unknowns. You can solve the problem. So we use, they come here, we've got two cells, three cells. So we can use compatibility equations twice. So if I have four cells, four minus one, I can use the compatibility equations three times. Plus the equilibrium gives me four. Does it answer the question? Okay, so you can equate the rate of twist for length of the section one and section three, and then you can do friction two and section three, and then the torque. Excellent. You can either use one and two, two and three, or one and three. So two, you can use two of them because the third one will be, will not be depend, independent. And then you can solve it. And if I was asked, you were asked to find the total energy stored, my advice to you is find the rate of twist or angle of twist in radians multiplied by t, divided by two. Because if you use the equation I showed you earlier, it's very, very complicated to find the energy stored. Any other questions here? So first we started with, this is, I'm explaining it at the start because this is a common mistake among the students in the exam. They just use the equations for the wrong problem, I mean for the wrong, uh, the wrong, the solution, for the, the wrong solution or the wrong equations uh, for uh, uh, the example they are solving in the exam. So we started with the circular cylinders and now we moved on to Thin wall sections, single cell models. You can see equations are completely different. Now this year I added this part as well, torsion of open sections subject to torsion. So this is relatively straightforward. So we have, I started with analysis of a thin strip subject to torsion. So we've got this equation. So I started with analysis of a thin strip subject to torsion. So we have this equation, and I think I wrote it out, this is the best one. So you have this equation to find the angle of twist or rate of twist, the shear stress, and um, obviously this two we are after. Now here, J is not the polar second moment of area. 
is called the torsion constant of the section. It has the same unit, but it's not called the polar second moment today. So this is, for example, if the length of the um, strip is B, the thickness is T, you've got 1 over 3 BT cubed. This is the torsion constant. Y here is if I locate the Cartesian coordinate system at the center of the strip, Y is the distance of any point from this axis here. So T is the thickness of the strip. And as I said, this equation is the best one to use. Obviously, we have the maximum stresses on the top and bottom layers. Even for this tiny section, we have shear stress variation. It's not like the other section we assumed and there is no variation of the shear stress uh, through thickness. For this analysis, we assume that shear stress is constant, shear flow is constant. There is no through thickness variation of shear stress. But here, although it is thin, we assume there is a shear stress variation. You can see it depends on y. We have a zero on this line, on the x-axis, and we have maximum on the bottom and top layer. So that's why you end up with this equation. And y is plus minus 2 over 2. And you substitute in this equation, the maximum shear stress is equal to 3t divided bt squared. And we can use the same equation for all these open sections. And if the thickness is constant, then we just use the same equation, b is the total length of the section. And if the thickness is variable, obviously, the torsion constant, or some well-known torsion constant, is defined by this equation. You can find it in your um, examination data sheets. I repeat, this y is not a y coordinate. It's y is the distance of the top and bottom layer of the shell from its center. And I believe I think this is just what I uh, picked from chapter one. So on the slide number 19, we can find the polar second moment of area approximately using this equation, 2 power cube t, or we can uh, use the exact solution using the equation we use at the start of this chapter. And here I showed you what the definition of compatibility, combining compatibility, and equilibrium for problem, for solving problems which are indeterminate. So any problem or related to this chapter. Examples. Any issues with examples in chapter four? Yes, please. is a very, very good question. When a comp if, say if you've got a wing section, which is a combination of closed sections and open section. So when it comes to design, the, thin, the open section usually has no strength or stiffness in its contortion, so usually ignored. Now, I usually didn't teach this part to the to students, so I thought perhaps I added to um, the lecture slides. When it comes uh, to torsion, the open sections, they hardly have any strength or stiffness. So that's the reason that, because BT cubed is very, very small. So what you see here, you end up with a large value of shear stress and a large value of angle of twist. You then you have an open section subject to torsion. But whatever you are saying is absolutely correct. That's what I'm saying. When it comes to design of open sections of your torsion, they hardly have any strength or stiffness. So in other chapter, I just included it because I thought I need to. You need to know about it. 
Does it answer the question? So they are usually not e included in design because, as a, because they have the section, when it's open, hardly has any strength or stiffness. Yes, please. Um, the question six. This chapter. Okay. Um, question number six. Yeah? Mm, What's the problem? As, as, I, asked a, I had a specific question. If you can do the whole thing, that would be great. You want me to do the whole thing? Um, okay, fine. Ask, yeah. Um, but, like, because I was working out what J was, but I kept getting a different value to the one that you, like, calculated. So I was wondering how you work out J. I remember when I solved this problem, I gave you two different solutions. I gave you j when is equal to 2 pi r cubed t, and I also solved this, I showed you the solution when j was equal to pi over 32, 4 power of outer diameter minus 4 power of inner diameter. I put them on the same slide. So the two j's are not exactly the same, but they're very, very close. Oh, mine, was, mine wasn't close. Mine was like, you got three point one something, and I got like, Okay, how did you calculate it? Um, I think I got 2.9. I, I did the outer diameter to the 4 minus the inner diameter to the 4 times the diameter. Okay, here it says, and let me assume circle with the diameter of 200 millimeters. So when you say 200 millimeters, you usually assume it's a mean diameter. Yeah. So it's dm. It's, okay. So we have a 2 pi r cubed to 2 pi multiplied by 100 to the power of 3 times t, 5 millimeter. What do you get? Okay. So we've got <coughs> J equal to 2 pi r cubed T. R is equal to 100 millimeters to the power of 3. T is equal to 5 millimeters. Could you tell me what you get out of this? This is 3.14. Well, how much do you get? Uh, I got 31.4. So 31.4 times? 26. Okay. This is what uh, I showed you in the lecture. No, I think. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Are oh, you happy with it? Maybe you assumed 100 millimeters the outer diameter or inner diameter. That's why you ended up with the inner angles. You don't need any diameter, but however, if you want to assume it's an inner diameter, so we've got, this is the tube, I give it a, a bit of thickness, so this is the mean diameter, so at the moment, this is equal to 300. So mean diameter is equal to outer diameter plus inner diameter divided by 2. Sorry? So the mean diameter is 300, means this one is 300. So the thickness is 5 millimeters, so this is the thickness. So it means the outer diameter is equal to 300 plus 1 T. The inner diameter is equal to 300 minus T. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, okay, okay. Is it okay now? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just like but if I were you in exam, if I am given the mean diameter, just use the equation 2 pi r cubed t to find j. If I've got, I'm supposed to calculate i, I say it's pi r cubed t. So if, because this is for a semicircular cylinder, we've got pi r cubed t over 2. So, and you have this equation in exam. So if I've got half a, a semicircular one, this is equation is coming from, so this equation is coming from your examination paper sheets. So for a semicircular one, if it's a full cylinder, it becomes twice that. If it is a 
call the second moment of area because j is equal to i x plus i y then we've got pi r cube t plus i pi r cube t gives you 2 pi r cube t Okay. And you can work out like thick wall thing by like doing the outer J minus the inner J. Okay. So J equal to pi over 32 OD minus ID <coughs> is exact solution. Outer, inner. J equal to 2 pi r cube t is approximate solution. Okay? If I'm using this one, I say outer diameter is 300 plus t, inner diameter is 300 minus t. If I'm using this one... That's what, like, you know how you said that the outer diameter uh -huh. is 300 plus t? Yes. Are you happy now? Yeah, it makes sense. Good. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, have you done those three past papers in this section? No, 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 no past papers. No, no. If you ask the same question in the context of the um, chapters one and six, by all means, I am going to answer the question you asked. Look at the exam paper. Everything I, I in the exam papers are from uh, your um, your notes. All the questions were similar. If you just give me in the context of whatever you see here, by all means, I can answer. Yes, please. Uh, sorry, could you just repeat? You also got approximate ratio. Uh-huh. Uh, is the odd one the average radius, or is it the outer radius? Mean radius. Oh, the mean radius. Mean radius. So you would divide the, you would add the outer diameter and the inner diameter. Outer diameter plus inner diameter divided by two gives you mean diameter. Half of it becomes a mean radius. In exam, more likely you get the mean radius or mean diameter. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any, yes, please. Would it be wrong to use the uh, outer inner diameter solution rather than the approximate solution? It's not it's wrong. Good. No, of course not. Of course not. No, no. Okay. Whatever you prefer, just go for it. You will. I'm just trying to help you to save time. Yeah. But no, no. Oh, so we can use both of them interchangeably? Yeah, of course. Yes. Throughout the whole exam. Yes, of course, whatever you like, you go sure you're comfortable with. Yes? Yeah, so like for partial mistake. Uh-huh. Yeah, so like for the different energy and like the angle of trip for unit length, in your like working, you I think like if I'm not mistaken, you assume that the length is like one meter, right? Yes, it's per yeah, unit so length, like yes. In case if in exam there's like a question and then you just said like the length is like a certain like length. Uh -huh. So do you just assume it as one meter or like? You, you don't, if, if you haven't been given the length, you, usually you will be asked per unit length. Then you say one meter in engineering is per unit length. The, when we say per unit thickness, usually we go for one millimeter. But if you've been given the length of the structure as five meters, then you need to go for the actual length of the structure. This one, okay, in this one, I have asked you per unit, per unit volume of this structure. It means I'm asking you to find here, when I say per unit volume, it means I'm asking you to find S literally, which is equal to 2 squared divided by 2G. So that S literally is coming from the stress strain curve, the shear stress, shear strain, this is S literally, which is equal to 2 squared divided by 2g. So in the example here, it says a per unit volume, it means I'm after S literally. And in this example, again, the shear stress is constant. So I am allowed to use this equation multiplied by the volume, even if I was asked, if I was asked to find If I was asked to find uh, the total energy, 
I was allowed to use this equation, S capital, because the shear stress in that example is constant. We've got a thin wall set, a cylinder, which is subject to torsion. Shear stress is constant. So we, are, we were allowed to do that. Or you can just use, find the angle of two, it's multiplied by the torque, divided by two, you should get the same answer. Okay, any other question in regard to this example? Now, example number six, I showed you, I believe, two set, different sets of solutions. One, I used the equations for circular cylinders, and I also showed you the solution for thin wall sections of the torsion, single cell. So any problem with other examples we have here? Ex question number seven. Question number eight. Yes, please. Um, question 10. Okay, question number 10. Um, are you going to switch in each order a slightly different uh, equation for the angle? It had like torque in it and stuff, and I wondered why you did that. Okay. Now, this is, if you're analyzing a, so in the, in the first, this example, so we had a single cell, we had a fuselage with a single cell, which was subject to torsion. So A was, a was the area enclosed by the perimeter, right? So it was a single cell, so we say the torque applied is equal to 2A cubed. So it gives, based on what I showed you earlier, the torque is given, the area enclosed by the perimeter is given, it gives us a constant shear flow, which is T over 2A. Now, if I was asked to find the maximum shear stress, the maximum shear stress is Q by the T min, which is the minimum thickness. Now, if I was asked to find the angle of trees, I can either say it's equal to T 4A squared DS over GT, or I can use Q over 2A, a loop integral of a DS over GT, because the section is single cell. Now, if G is constant, it can be extracted from the integral, and we just go around the section Say this is the origin of the Kevin-Linear coordinate system. We just go round it. We divide the length of each panel or shell by its thickness to find this integral. Now for the second part, when we are analyzing the full fuselage section, I cannot use either of these two equations or this one. In this one, we have two A AQL, which is the equilibrium. Then for the angle of twist, similar to your coursework, so you've got the equilibrium, that's one equation. Then you say angle of twist for one is equal to the angle of twist of number two. <coughs> and then you use this equation, which is one over two Li QDS over GT, because Q is not constant anymore, it's variable. Again, common mistake among the students, they use this for multi-cell. This is not correct. You can see Q is inside because Q is variable. Angle of twist, do you rate for it or the angle of twist equal as well? Angle of twist is, obviously the length is the same. Angle of twist is the same as well. Yes, Q, that's a good question. Yes, question? That was a very good question. Just remember, this equation is for single cell. Okay, any other questions in relation to <coughs> any other question in relation to chapter four? So single cell, multi cell. You can see the equation is we've got equilibrium and this equation here goes inside the integral. Yes, please. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely correct. So we shouldn't prefer this one for single cell. And some, they were defined 
found Q, but you're right. If you have got T, it's better to use this one. So if your calculation with Q was not correct, it will affect your next solution. So sin, multi, single. But this is valid for both. This is valid for both of them. Any other questions in relation to chapter four? Please look at the past papers, what you can find which you haven't, I mean, if you have any questions. But I can answer it in the context of chapter four because it's what I said yes, in my announcement. But by all means, look at the past papers. If you think there is something missing I haven't covered during the lectures, which I, I don't think that's right, but anyway, if you feel I haven't covered, please ask me now. Anything related to chapter four? Okay, shall we? Yes. Just to make sure my understanding is correct. Yes, go on. So around, in the multi cell uh, for 10D, so the shear flow uh, around cell one and the shear flow around cell two Yeah, that, okay, so here we've got, we've got these two, so the torque applied, say this is the torque applied, <coughs> so this is a torque applied, so both shear flows are in the same direction, now we are in this cell at the moment, so based on this, this shear flow distribution, this is the shear flow applied because of this cell, so I call it Q2. Now, if we move on to this shell, to this, sorry, to this cell, so this is the shear flow distribution for this cell. So therefore, this is going backwards, this, the other way around. So they cancel out each other. It means the difference between the two is the shear flow in this, in this one. Now, I ask you a question. So this is Q2, this is Q1. If the shear stress in this wall, in this panel, is zero, what does this mean? Q2 equals Q1. So the shear flow is constant. Absolutely. <coughs> now, I ask you another question. If the shear stress in this panel is, say, one megapascal, what, what, is, what, what does this mean? Yeah, absolutely. And how do you, one, how do we relate one megapascal to Q1 and Q2? Um, so one megapascal is one newton per millimeter squared. Okay. Okay. So tell me. Okay, I ask you a different question. What is the shear flow in this? No. Okay. What is the shear flow in the horizontal panel? What is it? I mean, look at, forget about one of those What is the shear flow in the, <coughs> my apology. What is the shear flow in the horizontal panel? Q2 minus Q1. Well done. Q, say Q1 minus Q2, if Q1 is bigger than Q2. If the thickness of the panel is T, what is the shear stress in the horizontal panel? Q1 minus Q2 over T. Well done. Now. I am asking you, if the shear stress in the horizontal panel is one megapascal, mm -hmm. what would you say? I say, Q1 minus Q2 divided by T is one megapascal. Right. So, so Q1 minus Q2 is one. one. Divided by T. So, yeah. Um. So I repeat the question. In the exam, I say, the shear stress mm -hmm. in the horizontal panel is zero. Yeah. You automatically answer it. Q1 minus Q2 is zero. It means the two are equal. Now, in exam, I tell you the shear stress in the horizontal panel is one megapascal. What would you say? You say Q1 minus Q2 divided by T is equal to one megapascal. Are you happy with that now? Yeah. Okay. Now, the other example here we have. So you definitely get one question from sequencing, uh, one question from single cell, multi-cell tube subject to torsion. Definitely you have one question from open section this year as well. So definitely in exam paper, there's one question for, for a circular cylinder subject to torsion 
Definitely, there is one question. Are the single cell multi-cell most likely multi-cell subject to torsion? And definitely, you have one open section subject to torsion. And these three have need a three different sets of equations. No, no, <laughs> it's in the podcast. It's going to be in the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so solid solid cylinder a solid cylinder yeah. subject to torsion. A thin walled closed a section subject to torsion. Okay. The, the closed section could be single cell, could be multi cell. And finally, a, an open section, similar to the last uh, three questions of this chapter. Yeah. These three. Thirteen, fourteen and fifteen. I think thirteen, fourteen, fifteen and sixteen. Any other questions in relation to chapter four? Yes, please. When this, her open, her open sections and thin strips, no matter what, you use the same formulae, right? Yes, absolutely. But the difference is in calculation of J prime. J prime, same kind of So J prime, if you're analyzing an open section, which is subject to torsion, so we've got a J prime, the, that question that lady asked, is equal, J prime is equal to one and three B T cubed. So if you've got a strip, this is B, the total length of the tube. If you've got an open section at any shape, B is the total length. So this is provided, th so this is not a thin wall section, this, um, sorry, this is not thick wall, it's just the length I'm showing you, so this is B. So I can use this equation, provided the thickness is uniform. Now if I've got a section which has variable thickness, so, such as a T1, a T2, and a T3, then I say J prime, the torsion constant, or so minimum torsion constant is equal to B1, B2 and B3. So this is, so the equations are the same. So we've got The equations are this, you can see, you can use this equation for all of them. So the only difference is in calculation of J prime. And Y here is not this coordinate. So say we have XY coordinate system here. This Y has nothing to do with this Y. This Y is the distance of any layer from the center. So this is not this y. This y coordinate has nothing to do with this. This is, if you look at this strip section, this y is this distance. So y is the maximum y's are plus minus t over two. So if I've got a strip subject to torsion. So I used capital X, capital Y here, or it doesn't matter. So for this strip, yes, this is Y coordinate. So Y is plus minus T over two. Now if I'm analyzing, say this channel section, subject to torsion, so this is say this is the shear center of the section, is subject to a torque, then Y has nothing to do with this Y here, this Y Imagine you've got a section. And why is this distance? If you draw it like this strip, why is the distance from the mid shell of the panel or mid plane of the panel? Any other questions in relation to this chapter? Chapter four. Shall we move on to chapter five? Yes, you have your, your notes. Of course, I can, yes. Upper, here, or lower? 
Okay, I'll show you from the top. Are you happy with what I've got on here? You've got it in your notes. So you can use it for, so this gives you the shear modulus, rate of twist, the shear stress, what is the distance from the mid plane of the strip, torque applied, torsion constant. Yes. Plus minus two over two, yes, yes. Yes, if you use this equation here to find the maximum shear stress, so therefore your maximum shear stress ends up to be, so T, you've got Y is equal to two over two, this is a one over a three BT cube, so you end up with a three, I think you've got one of the, I showed you earlier. This is the equation for it, 3T, BTQ, BT squared. So shall we move on to chapter five? Are we happy with chapter four? So in chapter five, you analyze sections which were subject to bending. In chapter five, it doesn't matter the section is a thin section or a thick wood or solid section. We just use the same sets of equations. To find normal stress, shear stress, slope and deflection. The only difference is when the section is open, and obviously it's better to use a shear flow rather than a shear stress. And we can also make some approximation in calculation of the second moment of area. So in chapter five, when a structure is subject to bending, we are after normal stress, shear stress if it's subject to lateral shear force or distributed load, slope and deflection. And the only important thing which is important, I mean, we should, should, I should repeat to say, I mean, sh I should say in chapter five is that the sections have at least one axis of symmetry. They could have two, but they should, must have at least one axis of symmetry. So we call a chapter five asymmetric bending. So these are some examples. Notation used in this chapter. Again, some definitions. So I think this is new to you. In the it was new to you at the time in determinate beams. When the number of equilibrium equations is less than number of unknowns. And we called a uh, bending moment being positive or negative, not because it's clockwise or anticlockwise, if the bending moment applied makes the bottom section convex and to top one concave, we call it a positive bending, and other way around, we call it negative bending moment. So it doesn't matter, it's clockwise or anticlockwise. These are the equations you used um, in previous year as well, in, when you were year one, to draw the shear force and bending moment diagrams. So these are the, the, some examples for you for drawing the shear force and bending moment diagrams and writing the general equations when we write the equations in terms of Z. We always assume uh, the Z coordinate is, um, I mean, X and Y coordinates are attached to the cross section. Z is along the axis and we assume the origin of Z is at the end of, at the left end of the beam. So you can see here, we write the equations for W, the shear force, and the bending moment in terms of Z. So step functions, sometimes if the distribution of the force, the bending, I mean the moments on, or 
shear force, they are not continuous along this section, or along the beam. It's better to use a stiff function. And the characteristic of a, a stiff function is that whenever the value inside the brackets is negative, the function just disappears. And whenever the value inside the brackets is positive, they just get converted to a pair of ordinary brackets. And whenever you are using them in your equations, you just leave them alone. You do not integrate them term by term. You just keep them as a black box. And some examples here. So when a section is subject to bending, obviously the cross-section experiences normal stress. And the radius of the curvature is always measured or from uh, the neutral plane. So the section experiences uh, normal stress, which has a linear variation. We have zero stresses on the neutral plane or neutral axis. If the section is subject to a lateral shear force, Yes, please. Um, I can move to slide eight. Slide eight, yeah, of course I can. Um, right. To the left, uh, to the left diagonal, uh -huh. if the distributed load is on the right hand side, can okay. you just reverse the sign? It's like this one. You can just reverse the signs on the, the equations there? In the C function, you mean? Uh, no, in no, on the, let's say the, unit, the distributed load equation and the shear force equation. Okay. If the if the distributed load is the right hand side, similar to this one. Yeah. Okay. So we use, just use these equations. So this is on the right hand side. Yeah. I use these equations. So this one is on the left hand side. I assume I've got this top one, which is subtracted from the bottom one. Okay. So I don't. I mean, am I answering the question? Uh, I'm saying if it's on the right hand side. It is, no, it is on the right hand side. No, no, uh, but with, to, uh, with the, what do you call it, the simple... Simply uh, supported. Yeah, simply supported one. Uh, okay, this is simply supported as well. On the right side. I, I'm not with you. This is on the right hand side. No, in the simply supported one, if the uniform distributed... Okay, it doesn't make any difference. Okay, uh, yeah, right, I understood what you said. Okay, so this is a simply supported, this is a simply supported beam. Okay, and this is on the right hand side. Now, if you look at those equations, I'm not talking about the support. It doesn't affect the solution. Okay. If you look at those, so I find R1, I find R2, this is the group. So the distributed load at the moment, we've got it on the right hand side, say it is W. So say so so this is equal to A, it's minus W times Z minus A to the power of zero. Are you happy with this? So the shear force is minus W, I integrate it, and then I add R1. Now the bending moment is equal to minus W over two, Z minus A squared plus R1Z. I don't need to add anything because it's simply supported. Bending moment is zero. Does that answer the question? Do you agree that I have to add, see if this is length, I have to add L here because I need a stiff function for it. If I have an R, say I've got another one here, say I've got a force here. Say if I had a force here. If I had a force here, do you agree that I have to add F multiplied by, say this is B? I've add, say, z minus b to the power of zero. It's downwards, okay. So it's minus f times z to the power of z. Okay. Now, for this one, do you agree that I have to add this same function? It's in front of function. Oh, you have got to count, sorry. <laughs> okay, are you happy that I have to add this? Okay. Do you agree that this is always zero? Because we, the maximum z we could have is L. 
The characteristic of a zip function is not. Whenever the value inside it is negative, it just disappears. So zip cannot be more than L. So this is always zero. You can add it, but it has, does not affect the solution. Add it, R2. Oh, sorry, sorry, this is here. If you're sorry. I said, sorry, forget about it. This, I, I, this is for L. I didn't have a space, I wrote it here. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense, okay. <laughs> so you can add it, but it does not affect the solution. You end up with R, for this one, you end up with R2 times z minus l to the power of one, but this is always going to be zero. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so it will always be one. It always be zero. This one is always bigger. Oh, that is always zero. Okay. So shall we go back to the slides? So any questions in regard to so if of course uh, if the <coughs> beam is subject to bending, pure bending. The cross-section experiences normal stress, which has a linear variation. On the neutral axis, or neutral plane, we have zero stress, and on the top and bottom layers, we have maximum stresses, tension and compression. Now, if you've got a lateral shear force applied, obviously a lateral shear force also bends the beam. So in this case, not only we have normal stresses applied, but also shear stress on the cross-section and because of the characteristic of shear stress is complementary, we have in a longitudinal direction as well. So if we've got pure bending moment, we don't have shear stresses. We only have normal stress upper on the section. If we have shear force, we have normal stress on the section and shear stress as well, or sh for the shear flow that you did for your coursework as well. So this is normal stress applied on the section and that's the equation for the normal stress for a, um, a beam with, uh, which is symmetric which has one axis of symmetry the bending moment applied y is the, the, the distance of any layer from the neutral plane and i is the second moment of area and y is the distance and the, uh, a Neutral plane always, or neutral axis on the section always passes the center of gravity of the section. So that's how we found by equilibrium, we found uh, this equation. This equation is for solid sections subject to uh, bending, and if we want to find uh, the flexural shear stress for them, and deflection distribution, superposition method on the slide number 15. So up to chapter four, I mean chapters one, we had a few examples in relation to simple shear. In chapter four, you analyze the structures which are subject to torsion, obviously the outcome is shear stress. Now, if you've got a lateral shear force, this is not called simple shear anymore. It's called a flexure shear stress. So this could be a good exam question. What is flexural shear stress? So chapter one and chapter four, they were simple shear. In chapter five, we are applying a lateral shear force. The, the cross-section is subject to normal stress, also subject to shear stress. This shear stress of the lateral shear force is called flexural shear stress, which I've defined it for you on this slide, slide 16. So as I said, whatever we have in chapter five, they're applicable for thin sections, thick sections, and solid sections of your tube bending. Only when the section is thin, we can make some approximation in calculation of the second moment of area and usually are interested in flexure, uh, in shear flow rather than shear stress. And the definition of shear flow was the force applied per unit length. And that's the definition of it another, in terms of equation, the product of the thickness and the shear stress on the section. So on the slide 17, I just use the same equation I use 
four, I use four solid sections to find the shear stress and then shear flow. And later on, I expanded this equation and wrote it as Q equal to V divided by I, integral of TY dS. And that's the value of I, the first moment of area. So shear center, what is shear center? That was an exam question. Definition of shear center, you can just, just write over what I've written here. A point on the cross section, if I apply a force, a shear force uh, through it, it has no torsional effect. So if the section has two axes of symmetry, shear center and centroid are the same, if the section has one axis of symmetry, they are both located on the axis of symmetry, but they are not located in the same place. So centroid and shear center are not the same. So I showed you on the slide number 19, instead of using this equation, we can make some approximation. So this is a double integral, because the section is a thin, we write it as a single integral. And that's a question you asked before the, do you remember you asked me? What? So your problem is how to find a relation between Y and S. Is that the question you asked? Uh, well, not exactly, because if you consider like uh, what we're trying to uh, work through shear flow, uh -huh. uh, we're doing it like uh, the, the, the part within the integral is Y dA. Uh, I do understand the Y is that like the vertical, not, not exactly the vertical, but like the distance from the centroid to the like cross section. Uh huh. And then we're, when we're working through to find uh, the shear center, we're, we're working through integral of QR dS. Then what exactly the R? Okay, okay, okay. So here we've got the shear flow distribution. Are you happy with this equation here? So here we've got this is a question coming from chapter three which is finding uh, the f first moment of area of a section with respect to the to an axis, y dA. Now, because the section is a thin, we can say dA is equal to T dS, which the S is a cur curvilinear coordinate system. Now, in the question you're asking is about this equation, I believe. Okay. Now, I, we define the shear center, a point if I apply on a section, if I apply shear force through it, it has no torsional effect. So I've, I have applied this force through the shear center. So there is no torsional effect. It means a summation of the moments with respect to any point on the section must be zero, which is, which is what we see here. But what is this equation here? This is the moment created by the resisting shear flow inside the body. So if this is the shear flow here, so this is the shear flow, if I can use this, this is the shear flow here. So Q times a dS gives us a force. So Q multiplied by dS, that was the definition of the shear flow, the force applied per unit length. If I multiply by this, it gives me the force, the shear force applied here. Now this is located at the distance of R from the Wherever I'm finding the moment with respect to. So R is a variable. And that's a perpendicular distance of this force from this center. So R, capital R, is the perpendicular distance of this force from this center. Now, you agree that each of these, if I divide this to a lot of uh, smaller elements, I add all these forces. So this is at the moment, a moment. This is a force. And this is a moment. This is the resisting moment. This is the resisting moment in this tiny element. Now I'm going to add them up. Well, mathematically, I'm going to find the integral of all these moments. So this is the integral of all the little moments we have here. This must be equal to the external moment, which is F times EX. So R is a variable. Now,
So I'm going to move on to here. This is a good example. So here, we find the shear flow distribution. Are you happy with this equation? Are you happy with what I've got here? So this is the same equation as you see here. We are finding the moments, external moment and internal resisting moment. Now this is, do you agree that each point on the section has the same uh, distance from the center of the semicircle? Are you happy if I say capital R is the same as the radius of this semicircular section? Because if I just have this element here, this has this sense, this force, this little force is at the distance of R. If I have an element here, it is also at the distance of R. So I can say capital R and little r for this section are the same. Now this R d theta is because of ds. So if I just say here, so ds is equal to R d theta. This capital R is equal to little r. And this is the shear flow distribution coming from the top. Are we happy? Okay. Now let's move on to the next one. Now in this channel section, in the channel section, we find the shear flow distribution for each of these panels. Now the next stage is finding the position of the shear center. So summation of the forces with just moments with respect to any point is zero. So F times EX. Now for this one, R this is R. For the top panel. So this panel is passing through point O, so R is zero, and for the bottom one, all the points on the panel have the same distance from a point O. So in this case, R is equal to, what is this distance? I think it's H, and this is H as well. So here we've got H, which is R. And the same as this one. Are we happy here? Does it answer the question? Yeah. Do you ask and so another question? I believe. Um, okay. And yes, please. That's good. Okay. So this is this equation here. R is a length. It's a distance uh, from um, it's a distance uh, from the center. You're finding the moment with respect to R is a distance. Q is a shear flow. Q times ds is a force, shear force. Q times ds times R gives you a little moment. So what you see on the right-hand side is moment. What you see on the left-hand side is also a moment. Okay. So what I do, this is a, so this is a moment, and this is a moment. Then if you want to add ex, you find, divide a moment by a force. Yes, yes, this is the force applied here. Ex is the distance of the coordinate of the shear center. So it, and this is up to you which point you want to find the moments with respect to. It doesn't make any. So, like, uh, for that shear, is that like, is that like a long shear? Yeah, that's very good. So, this is, say, this is a semicircular section we're analyzing, this one. So we have this section, which is clamped at one end, 
and you're applying a cloth on the other side. This is what you see at the moment. Is make it this way, okay? You see in that way, okay? So this is a semicircular pin wall section. It has uniform cross-sectional area along its length, or uniform shape along its length. So say it's 10 meters, and it's subject to a torque. So it's clamped on this end, and you're applying a shear force. It's a cantilever beam. You're applying it here, at this and the other end. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, it's, it's a force. I've been talking for about two hours. Okay. It's a force. It's like that. Sorry, no. Uh, thank you for correcting me. It's a, it's a force, sorry. I'm a huge <laughs> Shear force. So it's clamped at one end. It's subject to shear force at its other end. Okay. Does it make sense? So you're looking at this cross section. So for the channel section, this is what we have. So say this is the channel section. So this is the channel, channel section. It's clamped at one end. This is the channel section you're seeing. So it's clamped at one end, and you're applying a force on the other end. Okay? Any other questions? So look at the examples of a chapter five. So you have the solutions for uh, example one on, on blackboard. It's like uh, example number two, very similar to the um, to the rig you tested on. It's a cantilever aluminium tube. It's subject to a shear force at its end, 10 kilonewtons. And the problem was asking us to find the maximum normal and shear stresses applied to the beam. Any problem with question number three? Yes, please. I don't have a problem because I've seen the, because I've seen the solutions and I've made notes on the solutions. But so, as a little uh, rule of thumb, so, so, so I should make the S directions counterclockwise and all external projections like here don't go to the uh, G, go to the center, right? Because I'm remembering two things, two um, examples I've seen. One involving the internal rib and the and 3D involving an external rib. So if it's an external rib, like 3D, it goes into the main line, right? But what if it's an internal rib, like the one that I saw in the, exa in the past picture? Oh, this is the question you asked. Okay, that is good. I mean, that's a fair... Uh, I, uh, okay, that, that one of the exam uh, questions is based on that. So here, I think uh, you've got a reinforcement here. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Now, if you've got a reinforcement here, in this case, it does not affect the solution because it is located on the neutral plane. For this uh, web, uh, y is equal to zero. Okay. Okay. Well, I think that's the, that was the question you asked. So here we've got... So we've got, say we've got this semicircular section, and it's got an internal reinforcement. So this is X, say this is Y, so this is the section we have, and we've got a reinforcement here as well. Now, when we find, when, when, when we are using this equation, Q equal to, say we are applying a shear force through the shear center. Okay? Now, we are using this equation, F divided by I, second moment of area, multiplied by T, Y, D, S. Which I said this is little i. Now, when you are finding, say, shear flow distribution, we locate the origin of the curvilinear coordinate system here. And then we find a shear flow distribution for that one. Now when we reach this point, then we find a shear flow distribution for this one. But y here is zero. Therefore, it does not affect the solution. 
So I tricked the students. This was not supposed to do anything for it. Just leave it. It's zero. It has no effect. It's zero. It's on the neutral axis. Okay, if it's not on the neutral axis, say we've got this one, okay, and say we've got a little bit here, and we are analyzing symmetric bending. Therefore, we want to also have another one here. So I start from there. The origin is here. I find the, say I call it one, two, three, and four. I find this shear fluid distribution for one, two. So this is going to be sinusoidal, so you'll end up with something distribution like that. Then we move on to this one. For two, three, there is y. So if I just look at the two, three, y is equal to this distance. So say it is equal to h. So here we've got y equal to h. Therefore, this gives us a linear distribution. So I substitute in this one, I say Q32 is equal to F divided by I, say T is constant comes out, Y is equal to H comes out, DS becomes S. So it gives us a linear distribution between three and two. And then we find the shear flow at this position, shear flow at this position, and then add them up, and then it starts from here. Then that becomes again sinusoidal. That's a bit unfair to give you in an exam. It's very hard. <laughs> but this one is quite a straightforward. It doesn't need to do anything. Yeah, it's zero. zero. It's zero because it's, on, it's a bit hard. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, you need to know how to do it. Yeah. Okay. Wait, miss. So, so the rule is if this, if this projection is to the outer, is out of the shape and not into the shape like an example you showed, the uh, Yes, because this is an open end. Yes. The way of explaining it like that is better to say, don't worry. So this is a zero. You have zero shear flow here because it's an open end. Do you agree? So it gets linear, it gets increased until it reaches this point. Does it answer the question? Yes. Okay. It does. Oh, right. Any other question? Yes, please. Yes. So, um, is the second moment that This is for the whole shape. I is for the whole shape. But because we cannot solve this um, uh, as one go, because the section, as you can see, has discontinuities, then we have to divide it to several integrals. So this, con this does not change. I is for I overall. Yeah? But because we can, it has these continuities, we need to divide it to simpler shapes, yeah. smaller sections otherwise. But this is a good question. Some of the students do that in the exam. Any other questions in relation to uh, this chapter? Yeah, it's kind of related. Uh, what? Is J prime, is it, uh, I mean, we don't have J prime here. Even though it's a thing? No, because the section is all subject to torsion. It's subject to bending. If it's subject to bending, we only deal with second moment of variance. In, in previous chapter, initially we started with J, which was the polar second moment of area, and then we move on the torsional constant. Yeah. Well, what I was going to ask you is, um, is J is equal to QI, I think, or is it No, J, the definition of J is. Okay. The definition of J is J is equal to IX plus IY. Right. Okay. Um, so can you do the same with J prime? No, 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 no. J prime, okay. J prime, which is defined for us a uniform thickness open section, is called torsional constant. It has nothing to do with the second moment of you. In books, they use the same. Um, symbol. I, I note I use J prime. I didn't want to confuse the students. We use J prime for it. Okay. And if we move on to a chapter, no, I don't want to confuse you. 
Oh. Say it again. You're not related then. No, no, you're not related. This is called torsion constant. What does the same job? Similar. Similar. But they is for a second moment of area. For we use it for circular sections. Even for a rectangular section, <coughs> we just use J, but does not affect the solution. We need to find the torsion constant of a solid se circular section. We use J primary in, in a different way, but anyway, did I answer the question? Okay. Yes, please. Any uh, questions? Is there, is there any no, 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 no. Shall we just stick to what you have? You're going to go have an exam tomorrow. Oh, okay. <laughs> to get confused. I mean, just have to stick to whatever you have in your notes. I don't want to confuse us. You're not hearing it later on. Any other questions? Yes, please. When, uh, on the exam presentation, Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. yes, yes. Um, is that the pi of the whole, the so if that one there, be like 200 something degrees, is, are we using the pi as 200 degrees, or do we have to use it like a semicircle so it's half, so it's to be less than the pi? Okay, I know we should, okay, you're talking about this equation here. So you're using, you're talking about, Give it to you in examples. Oh, okay, just give me a second. I think I know where it is. That is a good question, and I believe it's here. Is that the one you're asking? Yeah. Okay. Now, in, in this one, we do it for uh, an arc, which is less than 180 degrees. So phi in radians is the central angle of the arc. So if we had something that was like 200 degrees, do we have to put it in half and then double the whole thing? Yes, what you have to do, you need what you have, because if I've got, say, you're analyzing A section like that. I think I did it for you. Didn't I? So in this case, you find it for this semicircle, and you find for this arc and this arc. So you find it this for this one is pi r cubed c over two. This is for the semicircle, and then this central angle, whatever it is, based on that equation, you find it for this one and multiply it by two. Or sometimes it's easier to do it for full circle and subtract these two from it. So this is much easier. You can find for the full circle and subtract this part from it. Your choice, whichever you prefer. So based on the question you asked me, that equation, those two equations are for a, an arc which is less than 180 degrees. Does answer the question? And phi is in radians. Yes, yes. Yeah, just for this particular example, uh, which is like three half. Um, okay. Which uh, um, could be chapter? Uh, chapter five. Yeah. Okay. Three. Uh, this one. Yes. Yeah, this is the. Okay, so this one you can you can do it for one twenty multiplied by two. But we're talking about ix. We're not talking about shear fair distribution. For the for the shear fair distribution for half of it, but for ix you need to find the for the whole section. So 
So, yeah, that, that's all right. So, for, for the shape distribution, you're absolutely right. We do it for the half, and that's it. And for IS, we need the I for the whole section. So, for a whole section, based on the question that the gentleman asked, we do it for 120 degrees multiplied by 2. Is that, does it answer the question? So, you just find it for 120 degrees multiplied by 2, and then you add these two. And this for this point, for ignore the cut. You get exactly the same IX if there was no cut here. So you can do it for this vertical web. Any other questions in relation to this chapter? Any other questions? Anything that's, did I answer all the questions you asked? Okay. So chapter six, any problem with chapter six? Two dimensional. to dimensional stress strain analysis and we focus on the components which were subject to combine learning. Any problem with chapter yes please. Yes. This this one? Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Say if it, were, if it was a cantilever one, the same one, and we were applying the axial force to it, so if, but F doesn't change. So if it, it doesn't make any difference, this was a cantilever, F over A doesn't change. If it, the torque doesn't change, so TR over J doesn't change either, so these three remain the same. Now, if it was, inter, is it subject to internal pressure as well or not? Your hypothetical beam. Uh, Okay, so say everything was the same except it was subject to, it was a cantilever beam. So the torque, exactly the same. Internal pressure produces a circumferential stress PD over 2T and axial stress of PD over 4T. Now the bending moment, is it going to be this way or is it going to be a shear force applied? Okay, so in that case, if you look at this example, I think I solved it for you, and the solutions are online uh, in the podcast, so this one. So th in that case, the one I showed you on that slide, the bending moment is um, a pure bending moment. In this one, we've got a lateral shear force applied. So obviously, the maximum normal, the bending mm. moment applies at point one and two and three. So the bending moment at the end is zero. At the support, we have the maximum bending moment. So point one, so for point one, two and three, the, the same equation we can apply. So if you just go back to chapter six, so say we've got A support here. So say this is supported. We don't have this bending moment. Say we don't have it. Now we've got a lateral shear force here. So in that case, these points, the bending moment applied here, will be equal to F multiplied by this distance. Does it answer the question? And if it is at the support end, obviously, if this is L as well, then M becomes F times, L. everything else remains the same, because the value of the bending moment changes. Okay, anything else about uh, this uh, chapter? That force doesn't produce a shear force, right? 
it, it, um, the flexion shear stress is much, much higher than that shear force, that, that is ignorant. So I know what you're talking about is F over A, but ignorant. No, 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 ignore that. Just ignore it. Just flexure shear stress. And I usually, I, in, in this type of examples, I ask you to ignore the flexure shear. If, you, if, for example, in your coursework, I remember, I ask you to ignore, because at the moment, you don't see flexure shear stress here. The VI over IV doesn't exist. So, the coursework, if you look at your coursework, I ask you to ignore it. Any other examples? We've got five, ten minutes, five, six minutes left. Uh, yes, please. Which about the example two, the chapter? Which, which chapter? Um, chapter six. Chapter six. Um, on the page, is it question two? Chapter six, question number two, yes. Okay. What about question number two? Um, so you asked to find. Uh -huh. Y by zero. Uh -huh. um, does that mean you treat it as infinity and that's why it's angle 90 because it's... Yeah, I know. Okay, yes. Yeah. Yes. Then you end up with 45 degrees for the yeah. Yeah, principal direction. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, very good. Maximum principal plane would be fantastic, yes. Because in future, you are always interested in the maximum principal plane and maximum principal stress. But the other one is plus 90 degrees, yes. Okay. You don't need to bring anything. If I ask you a question, you just draw it by hand. No, don't bring anything. It's just dangerous. It's shocking. <laughs> Any other thing you want to ask? We just need to add, draw it by hand correctly and just show me the position of the maximum and minimum principal stresses. Approximate, I'm happy with that. Approximate drawing. Any other questions? Okay, time to go home and do your revision. <laughs> yes, please. For what you've done for us this term. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. You're okay. very welcome. Yeah, yes, thank you. You're the one who did all this for us. You're not the ones who did the stuff for you, so thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Go on, go on. Um, is it possible if I had, let's say, um, I'm two beams that were connected by a pin, like a sheer question, is it possible to no. write two different forces on either end? Could you draw it for me? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so is it possible to have something in a situation from the cross? Oh, I'm doing what the hell? Uh huh. Is it, uh, pin, yeah. Yeah. Is it possible to have like two. No, because this is not going to be in equilibrium. Okay, so they have to be equal then. Yeah, uh, I think one of the students sent me an email by him, by, uh, sent me a question by email. So this happens, this is actually a wall here. Yeah. So this is the reaction force, which it's is equal, equal to the first one. Okay. So right. you can't have two forces which are not equal. There won't be equilibrium yeah. in the x direction. Right, so if you didn't have two equal forces... It is not possible. It's just not possible. It's not accelerating. So we just start moving around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the only way you can have shit if they were if they weren't equal, then the resultant would just mean it would move. Uh, the only way you have shear is if they're equal. So you'd never give a question. 
I'm seeing you, bye. Oh, thank you. <laughs>